Well, loved ones, what I thought I would do was just very quickly mention what we had covered over the past winter in these Sunday evening services, and then that I would really keep my promise this time and stop in about 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, my wife is here, and so I have to stop in 10 minutes. And then you would ask questions. So maybe all I'm doing is giving you the opportunity to gather the questions together so that you can put them to me. Uh, loved ones, may I just share with you the heart of the gospel, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And no one can say more than that at the end of the day, loved ones. The heart of the gospel is the cross of Christ. And Paul stresses it again in chapter 2 and verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The death of Jesus is everything. The death of Jesus is everything. You don't need anything more than the death of Jesus. There's nothing else you need but the death of Jesus. And there's nothing else you need to enter into but the death of Jesus. If you enter into the death of Jesus, you will enter into the resurrection of Jesus and into the ascension of Jesus. Everything that will come to you that you need in this life comes in Christ. In Christ is everything. And you need nothing more than Jesus and nothing more than the death of Jesus. And however far you may get away in your own spiritual experience from what God wants for you, if you'll always come back to that, you'll be right at the door into victory. The death of Jesus, the death of Jesus. Wherever you go, whatever you think, whatever you feel, however many books you read, however many preachers you listen to, the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the cross of Christ, that's it. Loved ones, I never thought I'd be standing here preaching this because I, I believe the other way, that there were all kinds of other issues that were important. But now I know you need to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. He is the key to everything. And what we've been sharing on these Sunday evenings is that the great bulk of Christendom has entered no more into the death of Jesus than the Jews had. The Jews were baptized into the name of him who was to come. They believed that there was some mighty work that their great God had done in pre-eternity that enabled them to become related to them. And they didn't know what it was, but they sensed it was something to do with a great sacrifice. And in virtue of that, they sacrificed their lambs and their cattle. And the blood that was spilt on the altars was never meant by them to placate God the way the pagans tried to placate the evil spirits. For them it always stood for a great sacrifice that they couldn't fully understand, but that they knew had taken place in the heart of God. That somewhere there was some lamb slain from before the foundation of the world that provided all they needed for deliverance from their sin. And what we've been saying is that many evangelicals, many Christians have gone no further than that. Many Christians can go no further than to say, well, I, I know it's something to do with the death of Christ. I know that because of the death of Christ, God will forgive me and will receive me as his own child. I don't know why that happens. I don't know how it affects my life, but I believe it. And so there are millions and millions of sons and daughters of God who are really still born in a sense because they believe with their head that 
God has done something in Jesus to deliver them from their sin, but they don't really know what it is. And so they settle back down into that vague belief that the Jews had. Well, uh, I don't know what the cross of Christ has to do with my Father's acceptance of me, but I, I believe he accepts me because of the death of Christ. I believe that. Of course, they don't realize that even the demons believe and shudder. And so they go on living a life that is filled with sin, filled with sin. Not a life that is delivered from sin. They don't experience the Jesus who was called Jesus, you remember, Yehoshua in Hebrew, because he shall save his people from their sins. They don't experience the Savior who saves from sin. They are still living in the middle of their sins. And so it's really, I think it was Dave prayed, you know, that loved ones would gain release. They have no sense of release. They have no sense of the Spirit of God rising up within them and loving others and praising God. They have no sense of that. They walk as heavily as their counterparts do who don't believe anything about God or Jesus. They walk heavily because they walk in the midst of their sin. And what we have been saying, of course, is that the cross of Christ is the key to being saved from our sins. And when we are first born of God, we experience the Holy Spirit coming into our spirits. Because we believe Romans 5 and 8, that God has commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ has died for us. And we are urged, therefore, to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sins, and we'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we just go in on that level, and we believe. And the Holy Spirit comes in, and we're born again. We're born of God. But our lives are still governed from the outside. Loved ones, I'm going to run into trouble if somebody would bring me a, a paper. That would be good. Oh, a damp paper, and I would erase this. We still live from the body in. We still live from this body. We still live by what we receive from other people and from the world. We still live by the approval that other people give us. We still live by pleasing other people. We are still carnal people. And it's then that we begin to see the reality of the cross in a new way, Romans 6 and 6, that our old self was crucified with Christ. And yet the answer is still that song, trust and obey, for there's no other way. Because we're called upon, you remember in Romans 6 and 11, to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And we're called to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And by doing that, we enter into a deliverance from that old self that is talked about. Thanks. That is talked about in Romans 6 and 6. And we enter into the victory over sin that that brings. Love, I'm sorry. <laughs> the things a preacher's wife has to suffer. <laughs> Many of, us, many of us are delivered then from the domination of the body, but we find that we still have a soul that is much, you remember, like Peter's soul. It still operates by the habits it learned from the body. So he finds himself in the middle of the group when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he sees the men coming at him, and it's not that he hates the high priest's servant. It's not that he wants his own way, but for his Lord. He wants to save his Lord. And so his soul knows only one way to save, and that's to strike out. And he strikes out and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. And it's a soulish response, because the soul has been used for years to striking out that way. Many of us find it. We don't any longer want to cut people apart in our office, but we've got used to sarcasm. And the soulishness is there, and we hardly even know it's there. We cut out and we speak a harsh word. We don't even know it. So often in our homes, uh, the people that we live with in our Christian houses or the partners that we have at home, we cut out and we hurt them without even knowing that we're hurting them. 
It's that kind of soulishness that we find within us. And it's soulishness that we have to be delivered from. It's, it's there that we experience the daily cross of Christ, you remember, bearing our cross daily. And yet it's the same trust and obey. It's the same matter of believing what the Word of God shows us. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit. And then it's a matter of submitting to the breaking experiences, bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus that brings an end to that soulishness. And then finally, we find ourselves free to some great extent from the soulishness, and then we find that this little spirit in here is still passive. It just sits there, and it has to learn to go out. And we find again then that there is a glorious position in Jesus where we have been raised up with him and made to sit at the right hand of the Father. And we begin to have an active spirit. And we begin again, it's the same believing, believing that we were raised with Christ and then resisting Satan, James 4 and 7. And so it's always trust and obey, for there's no other way. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. And the same trust and obey, for there's no other way. As at the very beginning, when we were called upon to believe that Jesus had died for our sins and we were called upon to repent and turn our lives over to him. And so here, loved ones, we are freed from a guilty conscience. And the tragedy is that so many loved ones in Christendom have gone no further than that. Here we are saved from the old selfish will that wants its own way and insists on its own rights because we're still living inwards. And here we're saved from the independent soul that has got used to certain habits and keeps on doing them and has to be broken of those habits. And here we're saved from a passive spirit. And what we'll be doing, especially during the next two years, is of course talking about the details of the soul and the details of the spirit. But those could be regarded as at least four of the steps through which we pass in our Christian experience. And it's what people would call spiritual theology. But all of it is entering fully into the cross of Christ. And so many of us have found our lives going down, and then we were born of the Spirit, and that was the new birth. And we entered into the sense that Christ had died for our sins. And then we began to try to grow in grace, and we went into this up and down existence. And then we entered into the freedom from our selfish wills, where we were crucified with Christ. And then began the real growth in grace as we walked in the Spirit and came gradually free from that independent soul and came into a place where we could at last take our ascended position with Jesus in Ephesians 2 and 6. And all this, of course, is so that God's great plan for us would come true, that instead of being people who lived from the world in, we would live by the power of His Spirit coming into our lives and flowing out to others. And that was all achieved by the great cross of Christ, by which God destroyed that in turn reverse personality and renewed it in Jesus. And really, the move from there to there is all brought about by the Holy Spirit and is often, for many of us, brought about in those four stages. And the stages aren't important at all. I just realized that when I began the Christian walk, nobody explained to me what was possible. And I was so anxious that all of you would know that full salvation is God's will for us. And it is all found in Jesus' death. And if you say to me what happened in the New Testament, I would imagine they just entered into everything. I entered into certainly stages one and two when they were baptized and then began to grow through the experiences of having this soulish power broken and then came into this position where they could really be used to war against Satan. I will keep quiet. Are there any questions? Emma. Good. Emma is asking about 
really a very important verse because it's the first Christian instruction ever given to seekers after the first Christian sermon. So it is a key and a pivotal verse, and it's Acts 2 and 38. And you remember, Peter had just finished preaching the first Christian sermon. That's because there was no real Christianity until after Jesus was raised from the dead, you see, and ascended to the Father. And you remember, he said, the Spirit could not be given until I have ascended to the Father. So Christianity began after Jesus ascended to his Father. Acts 2 and 37, now when they heard this, the sermon where Peter said, you have crucified the Son of God, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Emma is saying, is that water baptism? And I honestly think, loved ones, that that our dear Father has always explained things easily and simply and not in any complicated fashion to us. And really, uh, when the Father talks about baptism, he's talking about that word baptizo, for those of you who know Greek or for those of us who don't, B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. Baptizo. And baptizo means immerse. I am a Methodist, so I am not pushing this from the point of view of water baptism. I'm pushing it from this angle, that God implies to us repeatedly throughout the gospel that unless you're immersed in Jesus, there is no salvation. Unless you are absolutely identified with Christ, Unless you reckon yourself to be dead indeed with Christ unto sin and alive to God, there is no salvation. And so the deep meaning of baptism and of the word baptize is to be immersed in Jesus. That's why so often in the Bible, uh, the word used for believe in Jesus is this word, eis, E-I-S. In Greek, that isn't in at all. That is into. And in the gospel, in the first century, they always exhorted people to be believe into Jesus, to believe into Jesus. Even if you take the makeup of the English word believe, and we've done this often, and break it into its two Anglo-Saxon counterparts and see that be means to be and lefan means in accordance with, then you see it even more fully. Because believing in Jesus means to be into Jesus in accordance with what happened in Jesus, where the whole of the human race was turned around and reversed and brought and rectified into what God wanted it to be. So in that, I think that first and foremost, the word baptize means to be immersed in Jesus. Now then, what the apostles did, they said, all right, you have to be baptized in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the loved ones would say, well, we are willing to be baptized. And then Peter would say, well, come to the river this afternoon. And then he would stand on the river bank, and the water would be there, and he would say to them, now, listen, as you go into the water here, as you go under this water, so you are being immersed into Jesus. And actually, don't you know that all of us here who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We've been buried with him. So that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in unity of life. So when you go down here into this water, under this water, then you die to all the world. You have no longer any contact with the world. The water covers over your head, so you're buried. You're a buried man. You're a buried woman. You have no longer any connection with the world. You can receive nothing from it. Anything that you receive, you must receive from what is under the water. So it is. You are being buried into Jesus. And from now on, anything you receive, you must receive from that womb that is round you now as you've entered into Christ. And so when you come up and you break this water with your head and you stand up, then 
the Holy Spirit will come upon you just as the dove of the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism. Everything that Jesus experienced, you will experience. And so the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be a new person because the old has passed away down here and you're a new creation. And so we're going to give you a Christian name. And that's what the first name was that we received in those days. It was a Christian name. You're no longer Simon. Your old name has gone with your old creation. You are Peter, a new person. And that's where we got the term Christian names, you know. That's, that's, we were a new generation, a generation of Jesus Christ. And so in the, I think in the old days, they had no, it wasn't a whole complex situation such as we emphasize. First you're baptized by water and then you're baptized with the Spirit and then you're baptized into the body of Christ. I do believe that people were simple and straightforward in those days and God identified baptism with the water, with the fullness of the Spirit, with baptism into the body of Jesus. Now, on the other hand, it's very important to point out that even in the New Testament times, not everybody entered into all of it. And so if you look at Acts 8, you'll see a plain example there of people to whom you remember Philip had preached Uh, Acts 8 and verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ and the multitudes with one accord gave heed to what was said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs which he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed crying with a loud voice and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. And uh, then in verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So they were baptized in water and uh, they were baptized into Jesus. And then in verse 14, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit for it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They completed what should have taken place at their baptism. And so it is today. There are many loved ones, uh, many of you, uh, I myself certainly, uh, believed that Jesus had died for my sins. And I believed that for that reason God had forgiven me. But I cried out, the good that I would I cannot do. And the evil I hate is the very thing I do. And that was my cry. I led a defeated Christian life. If you ask me why, well, I think for one thing, I didn't know that there was deliverance. For another thing, I had an easy gospel preached to me. I didn't really know that you were called upon to die with Jesus. I thought he had died so that I didn't have to die. And that was true physically. But I didn't know that I had to die with him by faith. So I didn't, partly I didn't know. But I have to be honest. There was a time in my life after, uh, sometime after 17 when I received Jesus as Savior. And there was a little voice that whispered, what would it be like to live your whole life only for Jesus? Irrespective of what it meant to you professionally or what it meant to you socially. And I looked around at the other friends I had in church and I said, but none of the rest are living that way. And so I believe that it wasn't just ignorance on my part. It was something of what was true in the Corinthian church. Paul couldn't preach to them because they were still carnal. He couldn't preach certain things because they were still behaving like ordinary men, because they were willfully rejecting the voice of the Spirit within them. And so I think many people in the New Testament times failed to enter into all the fullness of the Spirit at their baptism, one, because they didn't know about it, two, because they weren't willing to submit to the Holy Spirit. And anyone, you know, you have to be very honest with yourselves. If you still get angry, if you still get irritable with people, if you still experience envy or jealousy, or you bicker, then you're not cleansed by the Holy Spirit. And that's either because you don't know about it, which I'm not sure of now, or because you're not willing to submit to the consequences of not having envy, jealousy, and anger as weapons that you can use. 
And so, so in, I, that's what I would think. Maybe I'm wrong, I'm, uh, but that's what has made sense to me, both in Scripture and in personal experience. And so what we all have to do is encourage all of us to enter into all the fullness of Jesus, but then be honest with each other and help each other to see what we've entered into and what we haven't entered into. Now, would you like to push? Yes. Joe says that many uh, people would say, well, this may be true what you're saying about dying with Christ, but if I don't die with Christ, uh, will I go to hell? Will I lose even the salvation I have? Well, loved ones, I think you have to take you have to go to Scripture all the time on questions like that. And a Scripture that has helped me is John 15. And it's very plain. John 15. It's verse 6. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. And Joe, it seems to be, it's a question of whether they are willing to stay in Jesus or not. If you're going to stay in Jesus, you have to go with Jesus the whole way. You can't say, Lord, I'll stay with you to get my sins forgiven, but I'm not going to stay in you as you now show me more of what your Father did to me in you. I don't want that. It seems, in other words, you'd have to start grieving the Spirit of Jesus if you said, I'll go for the forgiveness of my sins and the freedom from guilt and a place in heaven, but I will not deal with this selfish will that gets angry and bad-tempered and envious. I don't want to go that far. It seems then, Joe, they have to step out of Christ. It seems to me that's what they're doing, you know. You can't be in Christ unless you're submissive to Christ and His Spirit. And it seems that this verse is suggesting that if you don't abide, abide means stay in me. If you don't stay in me, then you'll be cast forth as a branch and you'll wither, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. And even me, who is a man who really believes, uh, I would differ from him in this, but he who believes in eternal security, even he says, a man like that certainly lives as if he's dead. Lives as if he's dead. He has all the appearance in his life of death, of physical, of spiritual death. So I, I suppose, but Joe, the truth is, if a loved one is at that argumentative stage, it seems to me they're already probably grieving the Spirit's conviction in their hearts. And they need to be prayed for and loved rather than argued with. And the, the, the beauty about this whole deliverance is we can't argue each other into it. We can only pray and love and live each other into it. And that's the great call, I think, that we have. And uh, we should not be urging, in order to avoid hell, you must go this way. We should be saying, in order to be all that your Father planned you to be when he first created you. He is offering you this great salvation, this great deliverance. Um, say 